World champion Van der Poel comes home to win the 121st Paris-Roubaix. Salute the crowd. Welcome back to Beyond the Podium. I'm Phil Liggett. Alongside me is Bob Rowe, and we have just called one of the greatest Paris-Roubaix bike races, Bob. I've certainly seen, I'm sure you too. Uh, what a great win by Mathieu van der Poel. Unstoppable. <laughs> the hot favourite, he had even odds. So if you bet $100 on van der Poel, you get $100 back. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, but van der Poel confirming everybody's suspicion that he would be the strongest on the day, especially Wout van Aert not in the event last year because of a crash about 10 days ago in Doors der Vlaanderen. So no Wout yeah. van Aert. Made a run for it last year, but uh, without Wild Van Art, who else is going to be there? Mads Pedersen, I thought, might be close, but three minutes was the disadvantage to the Chasers, including Mads Pedersen, who wound up third. So good ride, but Vanderpool just too freaking good at Perry Roubaix. It's probably the yeah. race that suits him the best. And with his cyclocross background, uh, the way he can accelerate his endurance, and um, it was a real display of his power. The team was fantastic also so you put all that together no one's beaten Matthew Vanderpool in Paris Roubaix well it's not often the hot favorite meets the predictions but uh, nobody during the week gave anybody else to win this race and so it proved uh, but it all went so well he started his attack for home to win alone just on 60 kilometers from the finish he was on the tracks around Orshi on the cobble sector there now, the record victory margin of a 60-kilometre breakaway was by André Schmiel. And André, of course, long since retired. But, hey, I don't think he attacked right at this point to win the race. He just wanted somebody to go with him. But the fact was, Bob, nobody could go with him. He was simply too good. And the average speed at that point had been absolutely astounding. And he didn't slow down that much before the velodrome in Roubaix. And fastest average speed ever and going a long ways within a couple of hundred meters of Andre Chmiel years and years and years ago cycling yeah. a completely different sport this is one race that's similar to the first edition across the stone roads in the north of France but still usually the margins are incredibly tight in professional cycling nowadays so the three minutes he had at the finish line is really amazing well, he didn't quite get the longest victory, lone victory, from taking off because he was just about three-tenths of a kilometre short of André Schmiel's uh, breakaway on that year, back in 1994. But look what he did do, Bob. First of all, he became the first Dutch rider to go back-to-back -back in the two top classics of this part of the season. The Tour de Flandre, he won last week for a third time, and now he's won Paris-Roubaix for the second consecutive time, and he's gone back-to-back -back with the double. Uh, he's the first Dutchman ever to achieve that. He's also the world champion, so he's crossed the line here as a world champion winner. And the last man to do that was Peter Sagan in 2018. There's endless number of things. He also set the fastest time ever recorded for this race. He's now just short of 50 kilometres an hour. Of course, he also broke it last year, so he's improved on his own individual record. And, of course, he is uh, it's the biggest winning margin uh, since... Um, since Johan Museu managed to win uh, back, uh, uh, Tom Bonin rather, managed to win back in 08 and 09. A little bit confused there for you, Bob. It was Johan Museu who did that great ride. And uh, he lost by four seconds to get the biggest winning margin wow. since Johan. He's done his 29. all. Now 29 years of age, but two Perry Roubaix, the outright record shared by. Two Belgians, Roger de Vlaming, in the 70s and 80s. He was a pro, and in the 60s even. And Tom Bonin, Bonin, four wins. Matthew Vanderpool has a couple of years to equal that. To get five? Uh, that might be... He would be 33 years old at that time? Not impossible, the way he rode... Let's see if they gave him three minutes at the start of next year's career. <laughs> it was his winning margin from this year. Uh, no problem picking up the stone, even though it's pretty hefty for Matthew right. Vanderpool. Um, it's going to be pretty tough for Ankor for next year. Well, yes. 
Well, what about his challenges, Bob? I mean, realistically, Mats Pedersen was a guy that could step in and win today. He was a pretty strong favourite amongst the, uh, the bookies and amongst the fans. And he's such an aggressive rider. He's known as the internal fourth at the moment. Fourth to Van der Poel in the World Championships last year. He's had a fourth this year, Milan San Remo. He was fourth last year in this very race, Paris-Roubaix. Today, he was on the podium. That's what he wanted to be. But Van der Poel was just simply a different contender. He had his own private bike race. Uh, <laughs> I think Pedersen did ever, yeah. didn't he? Pedersen did everything possible. He did have yeah. bad luck. Worth worth also talking about the fact this is it when he gets quite frustrated here. He wants a wheel quick. He's in the right move, but now he's got to waste energy. And it's not the first time that he had to get back because earlier on he went on the wrong side of the road and he, he missed a split and he had to chase back. So he's had a lot of bad luck. But why doesn't Adrian van der Poel get the bad luck? He never gets any well, bad luck. Matthew van der Poel... Not uh, uh, he's he's so talented. I can't get over your camera angle, Phil. I look like a giant in comparison, not just my beard, but everything. But <laughs> be that as it may, I think without Wout Van Aert, we were going to see Matthew Vanderpool rampaging all over the other contenders. Yeah. Um, ex world champion Mads Pedersen, he might be able to go a little bit quicker, especially without a mechanical in the years to come. Uh, but as long as Matthew Vanderpool shows the kind of determination and team and ability that he showed this year, he's going to be tough to beat in, in the foreseeable future. Two, three, four years, depending on how long he wants to race. I think he'll always be competitive in Perry roubaix for, for, uh, for a long time to come. Even though he's 29, it's not his first, you know, run around the velodrome in Roubaix, but uh, I think he still could at least equal, if not better, the record held by two Belgians, De Vlamic and Bounin at four. Hey, Bob, what about this? For years, we talked about uh, the top teams from Belgium, like Sudol at the moment, but they're not firing now in the face of what Alpecin de Koenig are doing. We've had three so-called monuments, and it's three from three right now. The, the race as a big group can't control this team at all. It was a team race today. They could have won with Philipson, who finished second. But, of course, it went according to plan. Uh, it's, they're dominating now. Everybody was talking uh, about uh, Jumbo Visma last year. Now we're talking about another new team on the block. I'm surprised that Jasper Philipson hasn't at least entertained changing teams at some point. Um, mm. as, as long as he's on... The team with Matthew Vanderpool, Vanderpool did help him win Milano San Remo, so I'm sure he feels pretty satisfied. Also, Vanderpool leading him out for a number of stage win in last summer's Tour de France for Jasper Phillips, and so I'm sure he's pretty happy with the way it is. But I think maybe we'll see Phillipson change teams in the years to come. Vanderpool, by the way, a long contract with Alpeson, so it might be up to Phillipson to change teams to have a chance to win maybe Flanders and Roubaix against his teammate, Matthew Vanderpool. You know, if Vanderpool had a crash or some mechanicals earlier, then Jasper Philipson would have gotten his chance. But mm -hmm. as long as everything being equal, Vanderpool's always going to be the stronger, especially if they're teammates on races like Flanders and Ruby. The rest of the season, Philipson has an equal chance with his teammate, but they have definitely replaced Sudal as their historical best team for the classics in all of professional cycling. Um, and hey, Bob, if you I want to talk about Sudal, they were just nowhere to be seen in the classics no. so far. I'm going to leave you, Bob, to explain that getting to uh, Patrick Lefebvre. <laughs> I'd be happy I'm to. Sure. I'd, be, I'd love to talk to Patrick <laughs> after today. I, maybe uh, after he calms down a little bit. <laughs> 36th place. It's, if my math is right, Eve Lampart is their best yeah. rider, Phil. That's not what Sudal is known for, yeah. not what the riders are getting paid for, uh, not what their expectations are. They could have had, in the Ardennes Classics, a better chance with Remco Avenepoel. Now that sure. he's crashed out of Pays Basco, he will not be racing for the next few weeks. So I think it's not going to get any better for Sudal in the next couple of Classics to come. Yeah. Well, let's talk about... Uh... 
the new safety rules the, the tour has been very conscious of riders crashing too much and that's certainly be ev evidence this last couple of weeks of those terrible crashes in the uh, tour de pays basque um uh, now we've got this strain they call it a chicane the french did, but this isn't a chicane this is a roadblock you've got to turn right and herping back on yourself and turn right again to get back on the road which in effect goes straight ahead but the idea was to stop the race pouring in at high speed. Now, this race, at this point, Bob, was in excess average of over 50 kilometres an hour. Then comes this chicane. Well, everybody pretty satisfied with where they are in this group. This is the front group. And there's no reason. You're not going to improve your chances by taking a huge risk by trying to move up just before that right-hand bend. But if there was 140 guys, which we've seen in years past, just before the Truey of Arenberg, it would have been a very different story in the last four or five kilometers leading into that chicane. It worked this year, uh, but if the circumstances changes, it could be disastrous. I would recommend they get a more reasonable side streets and make a few rights and lefts on bigger boulevards before going in and maybe accessing the road they came off of just before the cobbles through the village beforehand. There's plenty of roads around there. I rode them when we were there just a couple of years ago at the Tour de France, if you remember, Phil. Our yeah. commentary position was right at the gates. I rode yeah. the cobbles of the Arenberg, tore my bike to pieces. I was glad to make it on work for the Tour de France on time. I had to run the last couple of kilometers because it ate my wheels to shreds, not up to the task for the cobbles, but the riders in Perry roubaix certainly have different bikes to ride and uh, <laughs> much more technically yeah. adept at getting across the cobbles. And uh, perhaps the ability of the riders also is a big factor in that. But they most certainly could find a more reasonable chicane going into that and making it safer, even if it was a bigger group. They lucked out, in my opinion, in this year's edition of Perry roubaix such a small group before the Forest of Arenberg. Well, with that, I agree, Bob. They lucked out because I think it's very difficult to do what they did anyway because I understand they do race into that forest at high speed. As soon as they hit the first cobblestones, riders tend to fall off or have flat tyres. We've had riders hurt quite seriously over the years in that forest area, including Johan Museu, who really did do his knee in on one occasion, kept him out for a long time. But they're very conscious now of the high speed of professional cycling. We're talking today of a new average speed for the race, and it's now approaching 50 kilometres an hour. It is incredibly quick. If riders are ploughing into that forest in excess of 50, 60 kilometres an hour, they're going to have more crashes. The crowd's always big there. Gone are the days when the crowds used to spill onto the road. I remember Dag, Dag Otto Lauritsen crashing many years ago. He simply disappeared through the crowd. Next scene, climbing out of a ditch, and the crowd was still cheering the race. He was behind the crowd. Those, those days have gone. But the right to be concerned about this, and they are saying, and so are the riders too, that these crashes are being caused by the riders themselves. And in fact, that's what happened with the accident to Adri van der Poel. He's just the back wheel of a teammate and it caused the pileup, which uh, has kept um, Adri out of the situation, without rather out of the situation today. I think the organisers know, though, are very conscious that they've got to address the safety of the racing. And the only way they can do that is to slow down the riders somehow at these dangerous points. I agree with you. I think they got away with it today. If that had been a bunch of 150 plus riders, as often is, because they use the forest to break the field up for the first time, it's only 100 kilometres done by the time they get there. There's still a long way to go to race, but that's always a decisive move. Um, but they, instead, the high speed today, coming in with just a bunch of 35, well, it was a piece of cake, wasn't it? Um, so they got away with it, and I agree with you. I'm sure for that reason alone, it'll be in next year as well. And then we'll see. Maybe the situation will change. Now we did see uh, first. We did see a rider uh, declassed in the sprint because he went off the track in the in the velodrome. But let's have a look at this one because Josh Charling. Now this guy is a really good bike rider. He's a young man. He was the second youngest rider in the race last year. He'd just been told there uh, by the referees he'd been disqualified. And now, Bob, this is the reason. He didn't want the cameras to stay with him anymore. He was absolutely fuming. He'd had a mechanical. There he is, holding on to the car, Bob. Now, you can't do that. After 
being caught in the big pileup before the cobbles ever started, playing catch up, then getting a mechanical, having to change his bike after a few sections of cobble. It's just a, a lapse in judgment for Josh Tarling. Um, if he hadn't done that, no way he's seeing the front for the rest of the day. So you want to do your team job. Tom Pidcock had no teammates in the finale. So I understand the impulse, the instinct um, to do what you could, but still the official was right behind him on the motorbike yeah. straight out of the race. If you're holding onto the, the car, you're gone. Uh, that's it. That's a hard and fast rule. And it's absolutely essential to maintain the fairness. If you're holding onto the car for extended periods of time, you just, it's the, one of the worst forms of cheating. So officials cannot turn a blind eye to that. So I think the disqualification was justified. Uh, but I can also see Josh Joshua's uh, the reasons why he did that. Just a little bit of desperation and otherwise never would have seen the front. And the group, by the way, that was just behind him at that moment, never caught back up to the front group because of the pressure from Alpeson. So um, he gambled and lost. Well, I agree again, Bob. Uh, in my days of being a commissar, I I did do the World Championships, and the hardest thing in a World Championship is to drive up to a rider and say, I'm sorry, but you're out of the race. Uh, I can't say what the riders tend to say to you, but uh, they're out of the race. I thought Josh took it very well. He realised there was a problem. He went to the car to say, what's going on? People are saying I'm disqualified, and the referee obviously confirmed it and kicked him out. Uh, he was fuming with himself, possibly. He was frustrated. But I also blame the Ineos team car there. They should have advised him immediately he hung onto that car door. They didn't know that that referee was on a motorbike just behind them. So I think the right decision was made, and I'm sure Josh will become a better bike rider because of it. Let's have a look at that finish, Bob. Uh, this is quite amusing, really. really. Uh, this is the way Bob Roll might have won a sprint. What's on the right-hand side of the picture as the sprint starts? The man in yellow makes the move, and he's now this on the short way around the velodrome. <laughs> yeah, this is a sprint for eighth place. Seven riders have already finished, but still, top ten in Paris-Roubaix is huge. But you have to stay within the blue line or above. You can't go into the infield. Very dangerous if someone is standing there. But Tim Van Dyke taking advantage of a moment's hesitation and was able to hold off the sprint, won by Jordi Mayus, but all for naught was put to the back of that field. I think that's justified. Um, oh, yeah. Next time, he will definitely not be going down on the infield of the track if he is in a similar position. But he and his twin brother had a pretty good pair of Roubaix field, in my estimation. And he would have loved Incredible. to have gotten eighth or ninth, but 16th, not bad. Same as his number, as you pointed out earlier, Bob. And his, his, uh, his twin brother was also in the mix as well. I think he was three places a better, better than him uh, after the disqualification. Or reclassification is a better word. Now, three Americans only in the race, Bob. And I thought they acquitted themselves very well. But the, the one at the young, one of the youngest riders ever to ride Peru Bay is, is the young rider... Um, which is Andrew August. I must confess, Bob, I hadn't heard of him until the race today. So, and Ineos Grenadiers, same team as Josh Tarling, by the way, uh, has been picked up by Ineos. And boy, that team must have spotted something special in this kid because he rode well and he reached the velodrome. Uh, I'm not sure he's on the result, though. I think he might have been uh, outside the time limit. Time limit of 8%, right around 26 wow. minutes. So, Joey Roscoff. Mm. His first pair Roubaix, by the way, at 36 years of age, impressive mm. for him to finish. And Riley Sheehan, not that far off the pace of Matthew Vanderpool, 12 minutes behind. So Riley riding yes. well. And Joey also and AJ, 18 years of age. And if he liked the cobbles, he got to the got to the velodrome, didn't get a placing. But if you fall in love with your first participation at 18 years of age, um, for AJ, <laughs> he might have uh, some big results in the future. Definitely has the talent, has the numbers. Ineos has signed him up for a long time. They wouldn't do that if they didn't know mm. that he is a special rider, at least physiologically. We'll see his development. It's going to be very interesting to watch. His teammate, by the way, on Ineos, Magnus Sheffield, comes from the same club. It's called Hot Tubes, and they've been around for a long time, and a lot of uh, big stars in American cycling have come from that program, including Matteo Jorgensen. So AJ August, yeah. the latest in the world tour for that little squad from the East Coast. He comes from upstate New York, but a big future predicted for AJ in the future.
Totally agree. I remember Christian van der Velde the other week on uh, on the on the program talking about uh, there aren't many Americans racing on the World Tour teams, but boy, they're picking the right races to win, like Brandon McNulty, for example, and others. So uh, I think we're in for a good year, especially in the Tour de France, Sepp Kuss as well, of course. Um, it didn't seem to me, Bob, I know the camera doesn't see every crash, but there didn't seem to be too many crashes today. The weather conditions, it was spring-like, it was lovely. There was this one, this, this was on a was... flat road, and, yeah. uh, and this is where we lost uh, Elia Viviani, he went to hospital before the cobbles ever started and they were flying at this point. Breakaway had just been established, but they were still averaging close to 55 kilometers an hour for the first hour and even over 50 Ks for the first two hours. Lawrence Rex from the Intermarche squad absolutely torn to ribbons, got back in his bike, got going again, then crashed again. Uh, but Ilya Viviani, his race is over at this point before they ever even got to the cobbles. Anyways, a high-speed crash, and after that, I was pleased that there were very few crashes, but this one looked absolutely horrible. Lawrence Rick going down for the second time in the race, and that was the end of his day in Prairie Roubaix. He might have thought about stopping uh, after his first crash, and I mean, it was yeah. nothing left of his, of his team kit. And no. very little left of his skin that was intact. Well, thank so, heavens, Bobby, he didn't lose the rest on that crash there. We would have been in trouble um, because he had a rough ride. Yeah, Bob, definitely. It's been, we have uh, been very privileged to commentate on a spectacular Paris Bay. Anything else stuck in your mind today that uh, you want to talk about? I love to watch Lawrence Pithy. We saw him in Paris Nice uh, having a great Paris Nice earlier in the year. Yeah. A real surprise. For the Groupama team, they don't often have that many riders <laughs> at the front of any classic. And for Kung and Pithy and Lawrence, uh, Louis Askey, excuse me, to be up there, impressive riding by the French team, Groupama. But hats off to Lawrence Pithy, uh, 21 years yeah. of age from New Zealand. I have a feeling he probably has never ridden that many cobbles in his whole life. Uh, but he has got a great talent. There's no question about that. And we'll see as he progresses on Perry roubaix in the years to come. Well, Pithy, of course, has all of his career in front of him, where John Degenkold is approaching the end of his, what an extraordinary good career he's had. A past winner riding today of Perry roubaix John, a game was in the thick of the action. Boy, he's had his shirt a bad luck in this race, but he did a brilliant ride today. Uh, you know, he's ridden this tour now 12 times. And Bob, guess how many times he's finished? 12 times. And he finished today in 11th place. He was in that sprint, by the way, um, when Van Dijker shot off the track to contest the sprint for 8th place. Um, I think, for me, uh, John Dettencourt will have gone home very, very happy, as will Lawrence Pithy today. But one man who's gone home absolutely delirious and will be mobbed when he gets back to the Netherlands is, of course, today's winner for the second year running, and that is Mathieu van der Poel. Good luck to him. He'll be in action again as the season continues. And we're going to say goodbye now from uh, our programme here. In, in Well, we're not in France. We'll give away a few secrets, of course. The race was in France. I'm in the UK. And Bob, happy smiling. Well, you should be. He's in Durango, Colorado. So uh, from us all, a very goodbye. And we'll see you next time. For all your cycling content year-round, subscribe to NBC Sports' YouTube page. We got it all.